Hey guys, thanks for tuning in this video. I created this video because I've been taking a deep dive into Kubernetes for work and I thought I'd share what I've been learning uh, with you guys. So this video is for anybody that is either a junior developer, software engineer, that is either heard of Docker and Kubernetes, maybe they see it at work, but they've been afraid to tinker with it, or maybe you are getting to microservices and you really wanna get an understanding and clarity to the concept of containers and I think the two most common tools that you'll hear in the workforce, which is Docker and Kubernetes. So this video hopefully will be short. I tend to uh, ramble, but I'm gonna start the first half of the video explaining the two technologies and some core concepts. And at the end, I'm going to deploy a simple express application. Um, I'm gonna make it into a Docker container. I'm gonna push it up to a Docker uh, repository, and then I'm actually going to run that in a Kubernetes cluster. So if this sounds interesting to you, please uh, stay tuned and follow along. So before we jump into Docker, which you see up here, and if you see me looking down or in a weird location, it's because I'm screen sharing uh, the desktop and then I'm also using a webcam to record myself. So my eyes may be all over the place. But uh, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is what is a container? Um, so first, actually, let's talk about two different architectures when it comes to developing software um, and web applications is a monolithic uh, architecture versus a microservice architecture. In simple terms, monolithic is probably what you're using nine times 10 for your small projects when you're learning to code. Um, you have all your logic and all your code in one uh, application. Uh, maybe that's one GitHub repository, all your logic for your social media app is all in one uh, code base. And it's easier to maintain for you when it's one team, but when you have multiple people or the code base gets really large, it can be hard to maintain. And if that goes down, everything about your application goes down as well. So it's really good for simple applications, maybe working on some yourself, or it's just something very basic um, that could work for simplicity purposes. Um, the other side is mi uh, microserver architecture, which is, excuse me, which is pretty much um, the idea of you separate a lot of the services and logic for your application into several applications that communicate with each other. Um, so if you were doing a social media app, you could have a notification service, you can have a profile management service, you have a payment service, you could have a whole bunch of different services that communicate with each other. Um, and if one goes down, some portions of your application may still keep running. Also, if you have a database, maybe you have a service for managing profile manage, uh, profiles, you can, let's say you are using React or something and you are, sorry, uh, Express and you wanna swap that out to, instead of using TypeScript, use Go. You can swap that service out and re reconstruct that, just that portion of the application, but everything else can still use TypeScript because they're separate applications. So it, it provides flexibility. It allows you to maintain it better. It allows you to um, just get deeper into individual portions of your applications. Um, also, when it comes to deployments, just being able to scale certain things um, is going to be also easier with microservices. So um, that's one concept that we definitely need to discuss. Now, the second thing you'll hear a lot of times you're talking about microservices are containers. Containers are pretty much individual running processes that hold all the logic and all the resources that they need to run um, versus all your resources being super dependent. Um, you can kind of separate them. And the idea again is there, your software is packaged up into, you know, packaged up in a way that it works out the box and then you just run it on something like Docker um, to pretty much run these containers. Um, these are similar to virtual machines, virtual machines which is kind of concept that's kind of hard for me to understand in the beginning is this idea of I have my MacBook, but I want to run Windows or Linux or some other operating system on my machine. You can run these virtual machines instead of like a physical Mac or physical Linux uh, device on your computer. So you have multiple operating systems on your on top of your operating system, um, which is it's kind of cool. Um, it's a compl complicated concept that won't really go into too much, but the uh, containers are very similar to them. Um, and what you'll do is with these microservices, you'll deploy all your applications into these containers that communicate with each other. They all have their own resources that they need. 
um, then one tool that you'll use to make containers or is Docker, which is like, I would say the top tier. I don't even know the other services out there, to be honest, but I know there are some, but you'll nine times I hear Docker when we talk about containers and Docker is several things. One is a tool software that you can use to bundle your code up into images to run containers. Um, and then you have also Docker, which I'm looking at right now, the website, which you can go to Docker hub. I have one up here right now, um, which is pretty much kind of like GitHub where you store your, instead of storing code, you store your images and you can make them public or private. So people can pull them down and use them. And these images can be built on top of each other, each other in layers, um, so that you can make more complicated applications. So Docker is, if you're getting into microservices and containers um, and deploying things to cloud, you probably should learn Docker. Um, Kubernetes is one that I've been scared of for a while. And I've, in my last job, I think they used it. I never had to touch it. And my next job, my current job now, I don't necessarily have to use it, but it's a tool that we do use that I might have to interact with. So I decided this week to kind of dive into it uh, more. Um, and I've actually been super hooked and that's why I'm making this video. So Kubernetes is pretty much a container orchestration tool, which you'll see all the time on their, on their uh, advertisements. What they mean by this is a way for you to manage your containers, um, make them more reliable and honestly more scalable. So instead of uh, just throwing up a Docker container and using something like uh, App Runner or uh, some other cloud provider like GCP or AWS, they'll have some service like Amazon Fargate to deploy your containers. Um, you may, that's good if you have like simple applications, you have maybe a few containers, but when you go to companies like Google and these bigger companies that have uh, tens, hundreds, or maybe even thousands of applications, you may have so many containers that you have to manage. And Kubernetes is good for that, for managing these, scaling them up or down, um, adding new services to them, seeing how they interact with each other, having other teams make uh, applications in your system without breaking other things. So again, I'm talking in the simple man's terms, but Kubernetes pretty much is a tool that you use to manage your containers. Docker is a way to make these containers and you can also run, run these containers um, and store images for uh, images that you can use to make containers. So the way it works in the way it works for Docker, at least is you make a Docker file that is like a blueprint for an image. You make an image based off that Docker file, and then you can keep it locally, but usually you want to push it to a repository like Docker Hub or uh, Amazon has a ECR, Elastic Container Registry. GCP has, a, a, I think it's a Artifact Registry. So there's you have options, but you generally don't want to just keep it on your local machine if it's something you're going to keep longer than just playing around with it. Um, and then once you get that image, you can run the container locally. You can deploy it to a, to a cloud environment um, and you can share it with others. And then again, if you have a lot of these containers and a lot of different applications, you might use a tool like Kubernetes to manage them. So that's kind of an overall of what those are. Again, this is like a basic overview, just trying to kind of explain them in a way that new people can understand them. Um, so now what I want to do is kind of, again, if you stay to this point is I'm going to actually create a simple, very basic application and get it all the way from code base to a Docker container to in a Kubernetes cluster. So stay tuned if you're interested in seeing this. All right, guys. So we're going to do a simple express app and deploy it. Um, well, really what we're going to do is going to make a Docker container, run it locally, and then actually run the image that we build in a Kubernetes cluster that we host locally. So um, I was going to walk through building this whole basic app, but I think a lot of you guys probably have done this before and it's not really the point of this tutorial. So a quick overview, we just have a simple node server that is going to send us some JSON back with a message and a date and then we are going to load the port from an environment variable. Uh, then 
yeah, that's pretty much what it's going to be. So if we do node index.js, it runs. Cool. You can also do npm to start, and that's what we'll use. Um, I have a Docker ignore file. If you are new to Docker, this is like the git ignore file where pretty much these will not be loaded into our image that we're going to build so that it's a smaller size. Um, these are unnecessary files. This is going to be security thing and just honestly an unnecessary load that we need to add. Um, and then no modules. This will be created into the file system in the container when we run our install command. So we don't need this. So yes. Yeah, so anyway, so now to make the Docker actual Docker file. It's going to be a pretty basic Docker file. We're just going to use uh, Docker's uh, official node image and you build images on top of each other. So we are going to create a working directory. This is where all the commands will happen and this directory will be in our running container or process. So then we're going to copy the package JSON file into our working directory again in the container so it's referring to this and then we are going to run this command this will install all of our dependencies which are just uh, express and env then we are going to expose our server port our port which is going to be an environment variable that we're referring to server port which is in here and we're also looking for it right here so that would be fine it will default to 3000 if you don't have it and i'll show you how to throw those in there so then we are going to npm start and that should be good enough to build this container uh build this image so now what we're going to do is make sure docker is running docker is running or starting right now cool it's running so now we're going to do is docker build give the image a name or tag we're going to call it uh what are we calling on here? Express app. And then we're going to use the current working directory. You see, this should be a quick build because it's a small image. Cool. I built that. So we go to Docker images. We have this image locally. So now what we're going to do is to run this locally, all we have to do is Docker run that says remove this will remove the container after any time we stop it so stopping it kind of pauses it and we can it keeps the state and then we can restart it uh, remove is actually going to remove the container altogether so we do uh, dash d is going to run it in the background and then the file or the image name which we don't have so let's actually do docker images here's the image id docker run remove that's the uh, that created a docker image and actually no we want to stop this actually this is just going to stop all running containers I don't feel like finding it Uh, why is this not running? Let's see. Uh, we don't have any cool because it probably failed. So, because the issue we're having is this port right here is going to be in a container and it needs to be mapped to our machine for us to access it. So, what we need to do is run the same docker run command but let's do dash p and map the port uh, we 
are gonna run the server. That's the port that it's gonna be. And then we are going to that. So that's gonna set the environment variable. And then we're gonna map port 8000 on the, in the container or on the machine to the containers port. And that should run it. Um, for some reason it's not starting, which is not good. So, oh, I know why, hold up. Let's remove this image. The issue is we did not copy in our working uh, all the rest of the files. So it's not starting anything. So that's why there's no process. So if we do Docker image remove, there you go. Then now we can do copy. We just need to index.js file and run copy that into there. Now if we do, this will build the image again. It was faster because it cached some of the dependencies. Now we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna map the port. We're gonna set the server port environment variable. We're gonna map, oh, that would have been a problem. Port. 8,000 in the contain uh, con on our machine to the container. So that's how we'll access it. And then we do not know the image. So what is the image ID? It is right here. Now we can, I don't know if it's the same one or not. That will run it, and now if we do, now we have a running container. There we go, and it's mapped to port 8000. So if I do curl localhost, it should be there. And you can see it returns some JSON. So the container is running in Docker now. Uh, and you can see there is our image that we built, and there is the container. And we can actually click it and we can see we're inside it and it's running correctly. So now what we're gonna do is docker yes, and we're gonna stop this container. So that's pretty much the basic workflow of a Docker container. All right, creating an uh, image in Docker and then running a container. Um, there's other more advanced stuff like Docker Compose, but we won't get into that in this video. Um, so now what we're going to do is docker stop. Again, this is going to uh, docker stop. PS, this is going to list all of the image uh, running containers and non running containers and just list their container ID not the whole thing, and then we'll stop all of those. This may take a couple seconds. There you go. So if we do this, not there. Okay, next thing we're gonna do is go, we're gonna actually, um, this image that we have, so we still have the image. We still have the image there, but we want to make sure that it's not just locally on our machine. Um, we want to be able to get it later or share it with other people. So what we're going to do is we're going to tag it, and I think it's called Express App, and we're going to call it. What you're, so you pretty much what you need is Docker Hub or whatever repository you're going to use. I'm using Docker Hub. I'm already logged in, I believe. You want to use your username. So we'll do Talo admin and then the name of the 
the image we want it to be and we'll give it a tag. You can have different tags. There we go, we tagged it. And then what we're gonna do is docker push. Talo admin slash express app. And it's pushing this to my repository. This may take a few seconds. Eventually we'll see this in our repository and I'm doing this so I can show an example of, okay, we build an application and we want to share it with our team and they want to pull the image down. Maybe this is your application and maybe it's your backend and you want to create a, uh, a image for your backend so the front end team could just spin up uh, a local instance of your backend service to play around with. Um, that's why this could be useful. This is going to take some time. So I'm going to pause the video and when it's done, continue. So my image has downloaded, uh, actually been pushed to Docker Hub. Um, if we do Docker images, you can see the local images right here. And here's the repository one right here. You see it, the date, uh, time, cause I've actually had to take a break from this for a little bit. Um, so if we go to here and we go to Docker Hub, you'll see the images right here. So, now that we know we have the image, um, I actually took the time to, um, I had a busy day, so I decided to create these files quickly instead of making this video 20 minutes long. And instead, I'm gonna walk you through uh, some basic commands and walk you through the files you'll need. So with Minikube, which I have up, um, when you, Kubernetes, um, you'll probably create a cluster um, on a cloud service like AWS or GCP, but if you are, um, trying to do local development or play with Kubernetes, you can use a software called uh, Minikube, uh, which creates a single node cluster locally on your machine, uh, do a virtual machine, and use different drivers. You can use whatever you want to run it, whether that is do Docker, do key EMU, which is what I'm using, or uh, Hy HyperKit. Um, if we go to This is the one I'm using. Um, so pretty much you need to use a driver. These are all the ones available for Mac. I'm using this one. And then this is the command I'm pretty much running. Um, and I'm also, I'm actually running this one because I want to actually expose my uh, services to the browser, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but yeah, this is a tool I'm using to kind of demonstrate to you how you would use Kubernetes. Um, if you were in production, you would create a cluster in a cloud and then you would connect your command line tool to that one. Uh, Minikube by default uh, will automatically configure it. Um, excuse me, configure the Kubernetes command line tool to, to point towards your local cluster. So um, anyway, so we have one. If I do, see I have it running right now. And, and you can see that it is configured. So now when you look into, so this is pretty much a command line tool, use kubectl, and if you do get all, you can see all of your components that you have. By default, you'll have this one in there. Um, so I don't have anything in there, but you can see. So the base level is a pod, which is an abstraction of a container, like your Docker container. and you can create more instances of your container or more multiple pods through deployments. You probably won't create a pod directly. You'll probably create a deployment so that way you can configure them and replicate them um, and connect them to other things. Um, so the main thing you're gonna create is probably a deployment. Then you're going to need to, um, if you need some type of storage, there's several things you can use. If you wanna persist data, you can use volumes. And which we're not going to talk about here, 
basic ones are config map and serve and um, config map and secrets are the base level storage which you'll see a lot where if you want to configure your your uh, your containers maybe there's a port number or some variables or whatever that you want to put in there and be able to easily change them in one place um, a config map is what you would use um, if you are talking about passwords or secrets you'll use a secret which stores it in base64 um, so there's some differences between the two but those are the two you'll probably see in this case we're using a config map because we're not going to use anything really special and then once you create these pods they all have their own IP address but pods are very volatile and they crash and get recreated all the time so if you're pointing anything to the IP address it's going to be it may be wrong because it might have crashed and it could be a new one so uh, what you need is a service to pretty much be a consistent IP address that references any pods for that deployment that way when they go up it's your people interacting with that API or that website they don't see the difference in the change in pods because they're referencing the same IP address um, so that will, you can do that and there's two different types an internal and external service um, and external the main difference is external it can be accessed by the browser so you'll need to create one of those to expose things for people to use over the internet so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go over these so we have a deployment right here we just have the version of what it is and this will be different depending on what kind of component you're making the kind of component make sure it's capitalized the metadata of the name, um, pretty much the name you'll see inside uh, the terminal. Labels and selectors are what we use so that different components know what to communicate with. Um, so the service needs to know what com uh, pods and what deployments um, um, they're referencing and you're giving access to and that's why we use selectors and labels. So we're matching on any components with the label express app. For the selector, we have two replicas of the container that we're going to create. This is the label for the container. A lot of times you'll notice that they'll all have pretty much the same name. So for this, you can run multiple containers in uh, a pod, but typically you won't see that. Um, so we're going to have the first one right here. The only one we have is an express container. Here's the image. It's the one that we pushed up. EMV, um, so this is like the environment variables which we need for our thing. It's looking for a server port. So, server port, and we're getting the value from our config map which we created, and I'll go over that. The name of the config map we're creating, and the key that's going to hold the value we need. Then, ports for this container, the container port is going to be 8000. So, now, if we go to config map, it's a pretty simple file. The version, the kind, config map, the name, example config, which you can see is right here. That's how we reference it. And this is just the value, the environment variable that we're grabbing. Port, which needs to be a different name than the actual environment variable. This is what our app is actually looking for. Then we have a service right here. Um, the version, all the same kind of stuff up here. By default, this will be a cluster IP, um, which is like the base level service. Then there's also a node port, which is not the most secure thing, um, pretty much unless you're doing non-production things and testing. That's probably the only reason why you would use that. And then a load balancer uses your cloud provider's load balancer. Uh, Minikube uses kind of implementation of Kubernetes load balancer, of a Kubernetes load balancer locally. Um, but this will is what we're using this type, so now, it will be exposed externally. And here's the port, the name of our port. It's going to be service port. This, And then we have the protocol TCP. The port for our container is 80, but the, uh, the, the port for the service is 80, but the target port, which is the container, is 8,000. And this needs to match the containers that are in there. Need that container port right there. So what we're going to do first is create the config map. So we're going to do to CTL apply chef config map. I guess what they're going to do all complete today. Oh, I know why, because we're in it wrong. K8.
There we go. And now I created that config map. Then we are going to create our, uh, hmm, let's create the service first. So we'll do the same command. The service is created and then we'll create it the deployment. So the plot keyword is, is when you have a YAML file, you can always also do create the type of component type. And then I think it's the images you're gonna use and then a bunch of like flags that you're gonna use like environment variable name, da da da. Um, I think when it gets really complicated and when you wanna change things dynamically, um, this is a better way to go. Okay, so we created all the type of components it says, so let's just check the state of all of these. So we'll do get all to see everything. And you see by default, when you create a deployment, it automatically creates a replica set component in the background as well. You can see that for our deployment to rep, uh, two or replicas is what we wanted and two are ready, which is good. Um, looks like these are the pods, the replicas of the, the pods. Again, we created two of them. You can see they're both up and running and we can also do And you can see we have the example config right here as well. So now if we want to um, ex just to verify that the pods are running, let's just grab one of these and let's see what it logs. So we get access to their their shell, their terminal, and just, okay, cool. So we know it's working. So now what we're gonna do is, this is not exposed though. So what we wanna do is expose this to the browser. If we went to the browser, it wouldn't work. So what we're gonna do is, um, because we're using a Minikube, we're gonna have to do this, um, where we do service. And then the name of the service, example, service. And now it actually created it. So let's see, service port is 80. So this is the port on there. So, and here's the URL. And you wouldn't have to do this if you weren't using Manicube and you had like your own cloud cluster. But so here is the IP address. And you see this will be consistent. So even when the pod, pod's IP address change, this will be the one that references them. And you can see, because I hit it, it returned back the JSON that we were expecting. So that is, in a nutshell, um, just a walkthrough, basic walkthrough of using, creating an express app, container, turn into a uh, an image what we ran on Docker and you can just do that separately. If you want to be able to control how many instances you have and scale them up and down based off of traffic. And again, this is very basic. You would probably have multiple applications. You can also do something called namespaces um, when Kubernetes where you could do, it creates, it gives you some by default, but it default is the one where all this stuff is getting created in, but you could do Kubernetes create namespace test namespace uh, oh sorry and pretty much you can group all these resources into different namespaces maybe you have different teams or whatever and all the components you could just do something like namespace test namespace and then all the resources that have that can work together communicate with each other and be grouped this is good when you have teams multiple big projects um so yeah kubernetes is very powerful i could do something right now where i let's take this out because that's not what we want let's say that okay things are we're messing with it locally and i want to scale it down i can go like this And 
I can do get and you can see I have none running right now and then I could go back up and say oh I need three now maybe I need to scale things back up cool now I have three they are not ready yet so it might take a couple seconds and now we have all three You see it, it scaling them down. So, yep, that is uh, just just playing around a little bit, but that is a nutshell a walkthrough of Docker and Kubernetes. I hope this video is helpful. It's kind of a longer video for my channel, but trying it out the tutorials. Sorry, it's late at night. I had to finish the video. But if you like this video and content like this, let me know and I'll make more content like this. If you didn't like it, let me know below as well. Open the feedback. I uh, appreciate you guys watching, supporting the channel, and I will see you guys next time.